Welcome to the north end of New Bedford. This complex of mills that we're going to be talking about tonight represents the apex, really, of investment, production. Um, the height of the textile industry is represented in the complex that we're going to see tonight. We're going to be doing a little bit of walking uh, to get to the next, next site, but basically it's these mills that we can see here. These are the, all were developed by one man, William Whitman. I'll talk about him when we get to his namesake mill, which is the Whaler's Cove Mill. We'll go, that's the next stop we're going to be making. But this here really was the high point of the Bedford development in the textile industry. Whitman was the first out-of-towner to invest in New Bedford. Prior to that, all the mills that, we've, that, that were developed, like the Howland Mill that we talked about last year, um, those, and the, the early mills, the Wamsutta Mill and so forth, they were developed and established by um, New Bedford people. New Bedford investors, mostly whaling industry money. And, um, but Whit Whitman was the first to come from out of town and develop a mill. And after that, the decade from when he, the decade and a half from when we, he first came here in 1895, and when this built, mill was built in 1910, development in the city was astronomical as far as mill production, mill construction, um, quality, quantity. It was off the charts. Mills were being built all over the place. And he was sort of the leader in doing that talk about him specifically in a few minutes. But the Nashawina Mill here, which also includes the big building here, the building that we're going to talk about when we come back with the, with the chimney, that was the power plant for Nashawina as well. Um, the technology had become very, very complex, relatively speaking. Um, because that mill across the street was powering this mill over here quite a, you know, that was really kind of, revo not revolutionary, but you could just tell that the, the times had changed. The big mills early on actually had the power plant in the mill itself. So, and the earliest mills, like, like Wamsutta, like Wamsutta 2 and 3, they had the, 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 the big machine right in the center of the building. It used to trans transect the entire building from floor to floor. But we had, they'd come a long way since then. And so we're going to talk about the, the, um, the power plant and the chimney uh, at the end of the tour because some interesting stories about that. The Nashawina weave shed that's behind us is one of the largest, if not the largest, weave shed ever built during this time. 225 feet wide. This is just the one story, the, the one and a half story building here. 220 feet wide and 805 feet long. That's a huge, huge, you can't even judge how big it is until you see it from overhead. An enormous building. Weave sheds were one story buildings, one and a half story. The shafting, if you remember when we talked about the, the uh, Howland Mills, about the shafting and the overhead and so forth, the shafting in the weave sheds was in the basement. So all those shafts that had the leather belts that connected to the machines, they were in the basement. And they connected through the floor. That's one of the reasons I wanted to go into the, into the mill if we possibly could. We, we couldn't because of the obvious reasons of the COVID-19 and so forth. But I was anxious to see the floors and because there had to be a lot of holes in the floor because all the belts came through the floor. Shafting in these buildings were, was in the basement. Um, and this is just a magnificent and huge building. Thank God it's, it's actually occupied now uh, by um, uh, the Joseph Boot factory. Um, all the mills that we're gonna talk about tonight were one point, at one point occupied after the textile industry by the apparel industry to make clothing for the most part. Um, so um, this is what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna start, we're gonna walk all the way down to the corner of the Whitman Mill, a little bit of a walk, and then we'll make our way back to this location here and we'll talk about all of the mills uh, as they develop. The mill here, which is a line about a quarter mile long, and there's two of them, there's one just like this behind it as well, is the, is the Whitman Mill. It was organized by a man named William Whitman. William Whitman was born in Canada, actually, 1842, Nova Scotia. 
came to the United States, he, he had a meteoric rise, considering he, it doesn't look like he really came from a lot of money um, as a, when he was born, but he just must have been very, very energetic and, and a go-getter because he rose through the ranks of, of uh, working in mills uh, as a manager and as a, uh, um, even a treasurer, an agent, pretty young in, in life, and he made a lot, enough money to start investing in owning his own mills. He owned a couple of mills in Lawrence, he had another mill in, in North Adams, and he was well known as a textile um, uh, tycoon by the time he came to New Bedford and built his namesake m mill, the Whitman Mill, 1895. As I said when we were at the last site, he was the first guy from out of town to establish a mill here. And he's caused a kind of a, a, a landslide after that of, of other investors coming in. Because all of a sudden, New Bedford became a hot place. Uh, 1895 actually was in the middle of an economic depression. So it wasn't until really around 1901 and so forth that, that lots of other people started to come. But Whitman brought with him as investors some of the biggest names in textiles at the time. The machine makers, like the Whitens. If you've been to Whitensville in, uh, the, in the Blackstone Valley in Massachusetts, it's a mill town. And of course, the Draper Corporation. I'm going to talk about the Draper Corporation in a little while. Those people were on the boards of these mills. So very, very uh, highly uh, capitalized, people with real money, uh, with a, a bigger vision even than, than, the, than what was probably normal in New Bedford. Um, the interesting thing, though, as I talked about at the last uh, tour, when I talked about Walter Langshaw, even with all these out-of-towners, people, high-powered people, they were subservient to the New Bedford Manufacturers Association, which was always New Bedford controlled. That organization was always controlled by the New Bedford mill owners. Uh, but Whitman and the others went along with it, apparently, without any difficulty. Odd thing about the Whit now, another thing about the Whitman mill here, it's really the most highly designed of the mills. When you look at this carefully, you can see there's lots of detail. The windows in particular are quite beautiful when you compare them to other windows and, wind and fenestration or window treatments on the other mills. It's a lot of glass, which was not common at this time in 1895. Um, and there's detailing across the top. There's nice detailing, you know, uh, uh, by the doorways. And so this is probably the most um, highly designed of all the mills. One man, one architect designed the entire complex over time. His name was Charles Allen Makepeace. Um, and even though the mills look all quite different, he designed every single one. Now, the odd thing about the Whitman Mill is that he lost control of it in 1900. <laughs> he had a falling out with his primary investing partner. His name was Edgar Harding. And he and Harding had a parting of the ways and um, one of the deals was that um, Harding would get the mill. They didn't change the name or anything. It still was called the Whitman Mill. But Whitman actually lost control of his namesake mill around 1902. Um, it was a spinning mill only at the time. Now, this is, a, this is I'm going to introduce now one of the most important part, one important events in tech, America, New England and really American textile history. That was the development and the invention of the automatic loom. Prior to the Draper Corporation in Hopedale, Mass, was a company town. I had a, uh, I did a tour for the UMass Dartmouth in, in the in the uh, in the fall, and I talked. To, I don't know how it came up that I started talking about the Draper Company because we were in down. We were in the. I don't know, it came up anyway. And there was a girl in, in, the, in the class from Hopedale, which is where the Draper Corporation was the company town for. And I said, do you know anything about the Draper Corporation? Because, you know, kids, I don't know how, how much it's emphasized and so forth. And she says, oh yeah, everybody knows about Draper in Hopedale, even though it's been out of business for about 50 years. Anyway, they were a maker exclusively manufacturer of looms power looms at the time. And in the late 1880s, they challenged their engineers 
to come up with an automatic loom. And in 1892, a man by the name of James Northrop invented the automatic loom. And it was a spectacularly complex and wonderful machine. It revolutionized the industry. All of a sudden, everybody needed a weave shed. Everybody started building weave sheds when they had no interest in them before. For instance, the, the Whitman Mill, this big empty lot here, which partially is parking lot, partially it's these, you know, relatively new auto globe and so, so forth. That was a weave shed that was built around 1910 or so to take advantage of the tremendous uh, profit possibilities with the automatic loom. The main thing about the automatic loom was this. The power loom needed a very, very skilled worker to operate four to six looms. And weavers in the years before 1900 were the highest paid members of the uh, operative community. Um, they would make $15 an hour, or $15 a week rather, when everybody else was making less. They were always the strongest uh, and most uh, highly paid workers. When the automatic loom was introduced into the, into the mills, a semi-skilled worker could manage 16 looms. The automatic loom was faster, better, it did more functions, and it was, and so all of a sudden, you know, you had this huge profit possibility. And uh, so all the mills started making um, weave sheds. Whitman, which had always been a spinning mill, only was built to be a spinning mill, built this giant weave shed in, on this lot here. When we were at the Howland Mill last year, most of us went to that particular tour. Um, that section where there's a shopping area now between mills one and two, that was completely filled with a weave shed. They, they, put, they built every single square footage they could in that area where there's, where there's the, strip, the strip mall now was a reef shed at one time. So it really revolutionized the industry and um, Draper Corporation made a fortune um, because everybody all of a sudden wanted the automatic loom. Other, co other companies got involved in the making the, of the automatic loom itself. The one I saw in operation at the American Textile History Museum, which unfortunately is out of business now, they had a spectacular exhibit of, of working machines and they had an automatic loom. It was amazing, absolutely amazing, um, how complex it was. And all of a sudden, the most important person working for the mills was the loom fixer. If you were a loom fixer in the first 20 years or 30 years uh, in New Bedford, that means you were the highest paid operative in because you had to have somebody to fix these things when they went down because they were so valuable. Okay, so um, Whitman loses the mill here to Harding, and he gets right back on his horse, and he builds the Manomet. The Manomet mill, again, gigantic. This is number one. That's number two. Number three is behind here, right behind this, this building. Um, when, they, when Manomet was at risk, there was some thought at one, about 10 or 15 years ago, tearing this down, it was, it was just a horrible thought. But uh, the only thing I thought is, you, just do not lose that plaque. <laughs> I love that plaque. Man, I met 1903. That's when the mill was built. Um, it was a spinning mill only. Um, this is a Whitman mill. He brought in the same invest, more or less the same investors he had for his other mills. Um, and uh, one of the biggest spinning operations in the city at its height, Manomet had almost 5,000 5, people working on the, at this site. They also had um, Manomet number four, which was behind the Belleville warehouse, which I'll talk about in a minute. Anyway, this was just a spinning mill, um, a huge operation. Now it's all been converted to housing. Most of it is, is housing. Apparently there's some subsidized housing for 50 and over. And, uh, but there's, there's market housing as well for uh, some, and I think, in, in the number two mill, which is the one further down. For many years, after the textile industry crashed in the, in, in during the Great Depression, the apparel industry took over lots of these mills. And this mill is always, by people from New Bedford, is always called the Cliff Tex building. 
because it was a men, uh, cliff text was a uh, men's suits i think and, and clothing uh, 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 shop yeah. for people making that again uh, make piece design this building nice nice windows here a little bit simpler design a more traditional design than this one um, but nonetheless pretty attractive building now before we leave the whole complex got huge you know when you look at old maps uh, of or even old pictures of these mills because there's quite a few you'll see these big long buildings in front they look like weave sheds, but they're not. All the weave sheds had the sawtooth roof. That's how they were built, for north light. That's what that was all about. To, give, to flood, you had these big giant uh, covered spaces with roof, but you needed lots of light in the middle. So they all have the saw, what they called sawtooth roof, north light windows on the north side of the sawtooth. So if you see the sawtooth, you know it's a, it's a uh, even in the pictures, you know it's a weave shed. If it's not, and it's a one-story building, because there was a lot of them, those are just storage buildings, just storage. But they had, obviously, this huge complex had a problem or, or the needed extra storage, and that's where the Belleville Warehouse came in. That's the gigantic building on Nash Road right by the train tracks, it's the concrete building that I talked about when, when it, was, it didn't come on the, the Howland Mill um, video, but it was part of the questions during the during that particular tour, and I actually said it was the, it, it was it is the biggest building ever built in New Bedford, and I said at the time for those who might have remembered that it was um, seven stories, 100 feet wide, and 600 feet long. It's actually 984 feet long. It's the largest building ever built in the city. It's huge. It's so huge. Again, it's like the Nashawina uh, weave shed. You can't even judge it unless you stand back. When you're driving on Florence Corner Road, um, where all that medical stuff is now, you can still see the gigantic Belleville Warehouse looming in the background. It's so big, it still dominates the landscape. And that was also, an, an, that was built in 1915. I think that they said so much, they had such a need for storage that Whitman decided we just gotta go large on this and they built this enormous building uh, on Nash Road, still there, um, huge. And mill number four was built behind that, and that was the Chamberlain uh, factory that made um, uh, howitzer shells during the Vietnam War. There was no workers' housing built for this for this site. When this site was in full operation, say 1912, when 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 uh, the National Wheat Mill was up and running, 10,000 employees worked in all these mills. 10,000. That, the, that was the number. It's hard to imagine there'd be that many people working in these mills. Five thousand, four, almost 5,000 just in Manomet alone, actually, in its height. And all the housing was developed privately. The three-decker, the multifamily, the two, the two and three family homes going up like crazy. Um, we get to the Nash when we get to Nashawina again, we'll talk a little bit about, about the, the housing at that time. In March of 1910, the New Bedford Evening Standard sent uh, a photographer and a reporter to this site to go and inspect the chimney. They how I found this article, I was flipping through the paper. 1909 was such a big year. Actually, it was 1910. It was such a big year for development in the textile industry that I was just going through the paper looking for stuff. Because there was always stuff in the paper about new mills, happenings, and so forth. So all of a sudden, I come across this picture, and it looks like an aerial view of the city. And I thought, 1910, how are they getting this picture? How are they getting this aerial view? You know, was there a balloon or something? No. From up there. <laughs> At the time, the chimney was not quite finished. They were chipping away. Now, I don't know how it was built. I tried as I may, I don't know how it was built. It's concrete. I don't know if it's poured in place. It's gotta be reinforced concrete. 
but it's concrete. It's not brick. You know, when you look at the maps, they always have color codes for the materials, and it's concrete. It says concrete. I don't know how they built it, but it's concrete. Anyway, it wasn't quite finished. I don't, you know, the top of the the top of the chimney needed to be uh, evened off. Look at the jet going by. Had to be evened off. Anyway, the newspaper guys meet the superintendent or the guy who's overseeing the building of the chimney. And inside the shaft, there's a rickety rackety elevator, steam powered elevator, that brings them inside the shaft, inside the, the chimney, to the top of this, of this thing. And, <laughs> and at the, to get to the top, of course there's, well I think it's 30 feet from the top, they get there's a platform and they get a ladder to get to the to the real top which is basically just a few boards across the, the opening it's so I'm afraid of heights just reading the article gives me the willies so they get to the top of this of this of the chimney they get to the top of the chimney and there's five or six guys up there and they're chipping away the last remnants of the concrete that doesn't make it round, you know, that I, I, I'm still not sure what they were chipping away, but they're chipping it away. And then they're just throwing it over the side. This probably is the tallest structure in New Bedford, 250 feet. There's a, there's a, the chimney at the old power plant downtown, in the old, uh, right where, the, where they were going to build the Oceanarium way back when, that building. There's a chimney there, that's also 250 feet. You can see it probably when we go to the street. If you look south, you could probably see it. It's either this built, this chimney or that chimney are the, uh, the tallest buildings ever built in New Bedford. Tallest structures ever built in New Bedford. So anyway, they're at the top there. Guys are, ch the guys are ch chipping off the last pieces and just throwing them over the side. And they were, you know, making, you know, it was just astounding, the, the reporters, that what they were doing because they were so haphazard about it. Anyway, they're up there and they took a picture of, they took a picture that was published in the paper, a photograph which was published in the paper looking that way, looking north. And there's nothing except the non-quit mill which was under, which uh, they were adding, which they were adding to They're up there, and they take a few pictures, and one of them is published in a paper, and it shows the north end. Well, it shows it's a it's a view north of here, directly north. You can see a little bit of the river. You can see the reconstruction or the building, Nanquitz building, a new building, uh, and they show that. But the rest, of, there's nothing else up here. I don't know where people were living, because the north end had not been developed yet. This is 1910, and we have all these people here. I don't know where they were living. Uh, they must have been putting up uh, tenements like crazy over here. I don't, I'm not sure where, where it was, but it's an interesting photograph, and it looks like, really, they're way up in the air, and they are way up in the air. They get in there, they get in the, they get back on the elevator, and the guys get out, and they say, it was the most, I couldn't wait to touch ground. <laughs> the thing was so rickety-rackety going up and down inside this chimney. 12 feet. 12 feet opening, 12 foot opening at the top. And they get down on the ground. They don't take, they don't show this. They, they get down on the ground. And the guys are standing on the edge waving to them who are chipping off the wave. They're standing right on the edge. No, no railings, no nothing, waving down below. The, um, the power plant, as I mentioned earlier, was state of the art. Turbines were used here, not the traditional steam engines, turbine engines, 1910 specified and built in the site. Um, so this was really quite a, uh, an important building. It had a huge job to do because the Nashawina Mill was a, uh, an enormous, enormous amount of machinery. Just the weave shed alone had 6,000 looms. It had to power 6,000 looms all, all, all by itself. Plus, you know, the, um, the spinning part of the mill was no, no small, no slouch either. So it had a lot of work to do, um, and apparently it did it well. The last mill in the line here is the non-quit mill. 
It goes all the way down to that, you can see that mill with the, uh, the facade that goes above the roof line. It goes, by, it goes there and it's really a very large complex as well. Um, much of it is behind, uh, behind it here. Uh, there's a large, uh, the land kind of bows out as it goes, the, the river sort of takes a little jog out and there's a lot of land behind here and that's all non-quit mill. It was a spinning mill, sort of the, uh, the stepchild almost as far as historic uh, significance is concerned to the others. It doesn't have as much history as some of the other mills. The non-quit was built in 1906, it was a spinning mill mostly. Uh, they did put a weave shed in later on. That mill that's way down there, you can see, that has the facade that's sticking above the roof line. That's one of the last mill buildings built during the textile era. It was called Nashawina Plant B. Built in 1926. I think I should remember mention about uh, uh, the Manomet. Whitman died in 1928. He lived through the strike mostly. He died in September before the strike was over in 1928. But he didn't. He didn't. Thank God for him. I guess he didn't uh, witness the Great Depression. But he did sense. He had to have sensed that something was wrong, and that that the, that textiles was becoming unsustainable not only in New England and New Bedford um, but in New England at large because he really divested himself of all of his Manomet holdings by 1927. He had sold them to other, play, other people. I think he realized that he had too much capacity um, but he still had, he had plenty of spinning capacity in Nashawina as well as Nonquit, because Nonquit's a pretty big plant, a very big plant, could be almost 100% spinning mill. One of the uh, most important part about Nonquit, it's one of the, it's the only mill of the, all that we saw tonight that survived the Great Depression. The Whitman Mill um, went belly up almost immediately after the Great Depression. The weave shed was taken down right away as a WPA project. Nashawina lasted until the, 18, the mid, the mid 1930s before it went out. Um, uh, Manomet had already been sold off and um, uh, Nonquit managed to survive. It didn't last too much longer than, uh, than World War II, but it did manage to survive um, the Great Depression. By the, the, the last mill, the last two mills um, to, to leave New Bedford was Wamsutter in the 1950s, mid-50s, and um, uh, the Hathaway, Brookshire Hathaway Mill in the South End in 1985. Um, it was such a catastrophe. The, the, the Great Depression was just so brutal to New Bedford. Uh, you had so many jobs that were forever lost, so much money was forever lost. Um, and even though the Nonquit managed to survive. It was just temporary. And what replaced, not right away in a large degree, but by the 50s and 60s, what replaced the textile industry was the apparel industry. The needle trades moved in to these, into these buildings and made clothes for many, many years until we decided um, that um, we would send all those jobs someplace else. <laughs> and so many people, you know, the International Garment, uh, Ladies' Garment Union was a big deal for a while, a very big deal for a while. It employed a lot of people here, and this, they're the ones who really occupied all these buildings after the, after the, uh, the textile industry uh, went out. Um, and now they're all gone, except really for Joseph Abood for the most part. There's a few textile bu businesses in, in Fall River that are active. Uh, I mean, not textiles, uh, apparel industries. There's really n no big time textiles being done in New England anymore. There's some small places, but nothing on the scale of what we had here. So, thanks for coming tonight, and uh, see you next time.